Good morning. Is this on? Yeah, that worked. Um, we're new to the building, so we're still trying to <laughs> figure some stuff out. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to everybody who's watching the live stream, um, and thanks to uh, the hundreds of people who will who will be watching uh, the video after the event today. Um, we appreciate your interest, and we appreciate you viewing this. Immigration has long been an important political, policy, and economic topic, and especially given the 2016 presidential campaign in the incoming Trump administration, immigration is at the forefront of the minds of many members of the policy community, of the academy, uh, and uh, in the American people. AEI is very happy to welcome George Borjas, one of the world's leading immigration scholars, to our stage today. George J. Borjas is the Robert W. Scrivener Professor of Economics and Social Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He was awarded the IZA Prize in Labor Economics in 2011. Dr. Borjas is the author of several books and the widely used textbook, Labor Economics. I have a copy of it up uh, on my desk, now in its seventh edition. His latest book is We Wanted Workers, Unraveling the Immigration Narrative, published by W.W. W. Norton in fall 2016. He has also published over 150 articles and books and scholarly journals. In 2016, Politico listed Dr. Borjas number 17 in its list of the 50 thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics for telling it like it is on immigration. Dr. Borjas will be joined in discussion by Stephen V. Roberts. Mr. Roberts has been a journalist for almost 50 years. His 25-year career with the New York Times included assignments as bureau chief in Los Angeles and Athens and as congressional and White House correspondent. He was a senior writer at U.S. News for seven years, specializing in national politics and foreign policy. He writes regular columns and is the author of several best-selling books. He appears frequently on broadcast media. Since 1997, he has been the Shapiro Professor of Media and Public Affairs at George, at George Washington University, where he has taught for the last 23 years. Uh, the format of this will be very straightforward. The two gentlemen will talk for 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Thank you again for being here, and thanks again to all of you who are watching the video. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, both of us delighted to be here. Um, uh, we both have a long interest in uh, immigration, partly because uh, Professor Borhaus and myself, both uh, children and grandchildren of immigrants, uh, I've written two books about immigration myself over the years. So this is a very common interest that we both share. Uh, and as uh, was mentioned, uh, this is an issue on the very forefront of the um, political scene. Yesterday, Vice President-elect Pence gave an interview to the Wall Street Journal, listed the top three issues that the Trump campaign would deal with in the first 100 days. Immigration was one of the three that he listed. So this is a, couldn't be a more timely topic. I'm delighted to have you here. And I want to start by asking you uh, about the core, one of the core arguments of your book, which is you, you've been quoted many times as saying, immigration is just another government redistribution program. And you often have said, just should be in italics. <laughs> Explain what you mean by that. What I mean by that is that, uh, like trade, immigration creates gains for the receiving country. I mean, the usual argument for free trade is that even though some people lose, there are other people who gain, like consumers, for example. And the economic pie accruing to the country, to the natives, actually expands. Immigration is like that. So there's an expansion of the economic pie as a result of the workers coming in and uh, through their labor market activities. But immigration differs in one fundamental way from trade. And it sort of refers, go back to, to the title of my book, We Want to Work, We've Got People Instead. Immigrants are not just robotic workers. So that means that there are other consequences of immigration that, got, that one has to take into account and compare those consequences with the gains that you would get from looking at it as just a collection of workers. And one particular aspect that you might want to look at in terms of dollars and cents is the impact of immigration on the welfare state. And uh, what we know is that immigrants who tend to be disproportionately low skill tend to qualify and participate much more in welfare programs than natives do. And that's just a fact of life. There's nothing, that, that's not saying that immigrants come to this country because they want to get on welfare. It's not saying that at all. It's just saying, look, the welfare state is structured in a way that basically redistributes wealth from people who are well off to people who need help, to the disadvantage. And immigrants, given that they're low skill, you know, disproportionately so, 
tend to qualify and tend to be in the bottom of the income distribution and skill distribution much more often than you would expect. So they, of course, they're going to receive the, these kinds of assistance. Plus, immigrants procreate. They have kids. It is expensive to send the kids to school and so on, right? So that means that immigrants have created costs outside the factory gates. And one, what one has to do is compare the gain that comes from the productive contributions to the cost they create outside the factory gate. Now, there's obviously a lot of this dispute and contention of what these numbers are, right? But for example, the National Academy a couple of months ago published a report. In that report, uh, they come up with the usual number of what the gains are to natives. And the economic pie to natives goes up by around $50 billion a year, which is a lot of money, actually. Uh, but then one has to contrast that $50 billion with what the cost through the welfare state and through the public assistance program and, and public services are. And those costs, according to the National Academy, are actually at least $50 billion. And that's where I'm going to compare. I'm going to, take the, I'm going to take sort of the conservative point of view and say, let the cost be the smallest number that we can estimate them to be, and it's around $50 billion. So if you compare the $50 billion gain with the cost of providing services, you basically have a net wash. And that's where I say, look, what's really happening is that it's a distributional impact. Because to create that $50 billion gain in the, in, in the, during their time in the factory, it's like free trade again. There are winners and there are losers. In the immigration context, the winners tend to be people who employ immigrants or who use immigrants. The losers tend to be people who compete with immigrants. And that transfer of wealth... But what about the immigrants themselves? And, and uh, I'm looking at it, I, I agree, they gain tremendously. Otherwise, they would leave. That's sort of the obvious answer to that, right? So, you know, that, it's, a, it's a great point that you raised. There are actually different constituencies to worry about. Right. And the question is, who should we worry about? Everything I just set up to now was looking at it from the native point of view. You bring, you bring the immigrants, and of course, their well-being matters a lot, too. And that should play a role in any kind of immigration policy to the, one that, to the extent that people should care about that. There's actually another group that you haven't mentioned, though, that's equally important, the people left behind. And the people left behind are also... In left the, behind in the home country, In the home countries. countries. Just think of what would happen to the people left behind when we have a policy that tries to extract high-skilled workers from all over the world. That means that a lot of the high skilled workers who could actually contribute to productivity in the in the home countries are actually leaving. Uh, you know? Let me let me ask you to, to, to define a little more closely. I'm, I'm getting your point, and and of course it's true that any public policy, whether it's trade, immigration, or any public policy, has winners and losers. Exactly. Define for us who you put in the winner category, who you put in the loser category. In terms of the economic impact, right. the winner category tends to be people who use immigrants. That's the way I sort of phrase it in general. The most obvious example of that is the employers who hire immigrants. immigrants a lot of immigrants come in, they tend to reduce the wage of competing workers, and that wage reduction, you know, somebody, it's like I say in the book, somebody's lower wage is somebody else's higher profit. Uh, the lower wage basically is a transfer of wealth to the employers who can now hire workers for much lower wages. So those are the winners. Now, some of that eventually trickles down to consumers because we use immigrants as well through buying produce or hiring people to, to do household work or whatever, right? So those are the winners. The losers... Well, would, you, would, would you include the immigrants themselves in the winners category? Uh, it, it all depends on what the objective function is. And by, the, by, by that, I mean the following. When we think of a policy, who should we care about? My answer until now, again, has been looking at it from the native point of view, but I would definitely include the winners to include immigrants as well. Okay. Because their income, at least, you know, if you come from a typical low-income country, your income will double, triple, quadruple if you come to the U.S. So they have a huge gain to be had by coming to the U.S. And that's actually something that, um, you know, I, it, it's actually a very nice thing for immigration. If you think about it, our immigration over the last 30, 40 years has given a chance to many low-skilled workers from all over the world to participate in the American dream. In, from one perspective, it's actually sort of like the largest anti-poverty program the world has ever devised. Which includes our ancestors, both of ours. Exactly, ancestors. exactly. Okay. And there's something, very, there's something very commendable to be said about the role that the U.S. played in that, role, in that regard. So I would definitely put the immigrants in, in, in the winner's category. Now, other people will say, well, when we think about immigration policy going forward, who should we worry about the most? Right. 
And that's where we can have a debate over values and who we should care about. Um, you mentioned the National Academy. Uh, yes. The National, Acad uh, National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, to give them their full title. They came out with a report in September. Right. You were a member of that panel. Correct. Um, here's the headline from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, on the Wall Street Journal report in September on this panel. Immigration does more good than harm to economy, study finds. They go on to say, uh, waves of immigrants coming into the U.S. in recent decades have helped the economy over the long haul and had la little lasting impact on the wages or employment levels of native-born Americans. Quote, immigration enlarges the economy. This is from the study. Enlarges the economy while leaving the native population slightly better off on average. The native population slightly better off on average. But the greatest beneficiaries of immigration are the immigrants themselves. Exactly. Now, you dissented from this report. Uh, I didn't dissent. I did not write a dissent to the report. I well, wrote the, the, a user's guide <laughs> in my website that I put in for people to... So but do you agree with the Wall Street Journal headline? Uh, immig Immigration does more good than harm to the economy. Study finds. Wall Street Journal. It all depends on how you interpret the data in the report, okay? Uh, in the report, I'm actually going to quote the report numbers themselves, right? In the report, they said there's no long-lasting impact. That's the quote you just mentioned, right? And that's what they say. In the long term, there's no impact on wages. That actually is a, is a result that's known from economics, that in the long run, under certain technical conditions in the economy, wage, the average wage returns to normal. The average wage returns to normal. That doesn't mean that a wage for every single person returns to normal. Because what that means, basically, is that the people who compete with immigrants tend to receive lower wages, and the people who complement immigrants tend to receive slightly higher wages, but on average, it evens out. And what, what we have to do, and that, that's what's missing from the Wall Street uh, Journal um, reporting, is that we want to compare, so what I was saying before, we want to compare the gains that accrue through, they said that there's a small gain for natives. That's well, that's, they're, they're saying, that the report comes yeah. to the conclusion Look, that, the, that there's more uh, winners than losers, more benefits than losses, but you don't agree with that. That's the Wall Street Journal's take on the report. Fair enough, okay. okay? And you know what I do in my class, actually, is I actually <laughs> I've done this for in the last semester as the report came out. I took headlines from several different newspapers showing exactly how different uh, news media- Interpret the study. Cite the study, mm -hmm. and they're completely different. They, they run all over the map because the report is ambiguous enough that if you want to pick and choose what you want to see, then mm -hmm. you're going to conclude whatever okay. you want. Uh, I tell you what I take the report to be. It is definitely true that the report says that the net gain to made is small, and the number they give is around $50 billion a year. That's in chapter three, I believe, of the report, okay? If you go to chapters eight and nine of the report, they then do the fiscal calculation, which shows you that in the short run, the fiscal burden accruing to natives is at least $50 billion a year. Now, the report never actually posts those, puts those two numbers together. And they leave it for the reader to sort of figure out what is going on. Uh, why they do that, I don't know. But uh, that's, the, that's where I, I added in my little uh, user's guide on the web to tr help readers sort of make sense of what all these numbers really meant. Now, as many of you know, and of course uh, you know, uh, your work, well known in this field over many years and, and highly respected, uh, but also is an outlier. Uh, that uh, uh, the fact is that the, uh, as the report says, um, uh, the, as economists weigh winners and losers, uh, gains and, 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 and uh, losses, uh, that most economists come out on the side that immigration is a net plus. Uh, let me just read you again a couple of headlines. This is from the Wall Street Journal uh, last week. Small businesses lament that there are too few Me Mexicans in the U.S., not too many. That's a Wall Street Journal headline from last week. Uh, and it goes on to discuss a number of industries, uh, quoting a number of, uh, uh, of employers, uh, and uh, a farmer, a citrus farmer in Florida says, right now, if I had 80 guys, I could put every one of them to work. Roofer in Texas says, it's the worst I have ever seen in my career. 
I would hire 60 roofers tomorrow. Now, if immigrants are replacing native workers, why are these, these shortages? Why are these employers on the ground trying to grow businesses, saying we need immigrants to fill these jobs which Americans are not filling? Because they want to make money. The more workers they have to pick from, the lower wages they have to apply. But they say they can't find anybody. See, they're, they're, they're employers. They're looking at, you know, what, what is their financial incentive? Uh, just think about, just think about uh, Bill Gates, okay? Bill Gates claims that every H-1B visa holder creates four new jobs for American workers, or for, for Microsoft, actually. That may well be true, but it's also a financial incentive in what Bill Gates says. The entry of a lot of programmers clearly holds down the, programming, the, the wage of programmers in the U.S. See, the correct statement is not that immigrants do jobs that Americans don't want to do. The correct statement is immigrants do jobs that natives don't want to do at the going wage. And that's a very different statement. Markets react to the presence and to the absence of immigrants. But that's, way, not we, what, that's not what they're saying. They're not saying we can't get workers. We're willing to pay. We can't get workers at any price. That's Look, what they're saying. Let me give you the example I, I sort of mentioned in the book, okay? Uh, in, in 2006, uh, you know, there's an ad in the book that I mm -hmm. print out, right? In 2006, Crider Corporation, or Crider Incorporated, uh, which Crider is a chicken processing plant in Georgia, right? And in 2006, as part of the Bush administration sort of show of force to show that they were really serious about immigration, they actually raided a lot of plants and they raided Crider. And over Labor Day weekend, Crider lost 75% of its workforce, which means that at least 75% of its workforce were undocumented mm -hmm. immigrants, right? Now, Crider wakes up on Monday morning or Tuesday morning after Labor Day and says, you know, we have a plan to operate, we have all this capital, what are we going to do? Well, what did Crider actually do? Crider is like those employers, you know, sort of st making mm -hmm. statements at the Wall Street Journal, right? What did Crider actually do on Tuesday morning? They put an ad in the paper which I reprint in my book. And the ad said increased wages. Okay, that was, you know, trying to attract workers. I mean, that's, that's the way supply and demand works. The laws of supply and demand do not stop operating simply because they are immigrants. Just think of what would happen to the way to say, uh, professors, journalism professors say, if we had an H-1B oh program. Yeah. What? Oh dear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> If we had an H-1B program that admitted 50,000 journalism professors a year, you know, GW would love it. Yeah, except, would love except it. that I'd be willing to admit that there are a lot more journalism professors than there are high-tech scientists who Microsoft wants, right? I mean, it's also supply and demand. That's not right. a really good analogy. No, but actually there's an analogy regarding the, the journalism that's very useful. There was in, indeed a supply shock in journalism in the last 20, 30 years. It's called the internet. A lot of people came in and started writing independently of the, of the main media. And what did that do to the journalism profession? Let me, uh, you, you made your, what did it do to the journalism profession? That's a big question. Um, I'm teaching young journalists at George Washington. I get that question every day. Um, uh, but it's like, it's interesting because the fact is journalism, like any other uh, business, any other industry, is dynamic. Right. And, I, and certain jobs are being destroyed and certain jobs are being created. Politico didn't even exist 10 years ago. I have half a dozen students who work for Politico. I have f f fewer students who work for the Washington Post or CNN, but more who work for Vox or Vice or Politico. So it's, a very, it's like any uh, business. It's, a, it's, that's right. it's dynamic no, destruction. That's why, right? that's why in all these studies we're trying to distinguish between the short run and the long run. In the short run, we know what's going to happen. In the long run, things tend to get attenuated. Now, we've talked a lot about the low-wage workers at the right. lower end of the spectrum. But one of the dimensions of immigration that receives a lot of attention from scholars um, is entrepreneurship. Right. Um, and, uh, for instance, uh, there was a report in, in, in CNN um, uh, that said immigrants are twice as likely to start businesses as native-born uh, entrepreneurs. Another figure that's widely used is that 28% of new businesses are started by immigrants, whereas they're only uh, foreign-born are only 13% of the population. So it's more than twice uh, their their uh, number in the population. Isn't this a, a a very important dimension of the value of immigration uh, that can't be measured simply uh, f by the metric of of uh, impact on wages? 
let me say two things about that. Number one, to the last question you raised, yes it is. Entrepreneurship, and especially when immigrants do things that didn't exist before in the economy, sort of introduce new products, introduce new ideas, that could be a tremendous gain to society, okay? Having said that, uh, it's one of the points I stress in my book. When you read data like that, claiming that immigrants do this at this rate versus that rate, it's very important to look at the details. Because uh, it is not that hard to look at the data and come up with very different answers. I've looked at the data on self-employment rate, which is actually the data that, that is available in typical census data. As of right now, I, I don't think I can actually make a claim that self-employment rates are much greater for immigrants and for natives. And a lot of, a lot of the self-employment tends to be in very small sort of mom and pop type businesses. And that's not the kind of business creation that people would talk about when you want to expand the economony a lot. But if, if, if but someone if, starts a lawn service and hires three people, that's no, a agree. plus for the economy. I agree. That, that's what I was saying before. To the extent that immigrants come in and produce new products, and, and so it's what's called create externalities, create spillovers on everybody else, that could be an incredibly useful thing. But the, it doesn't have to be Microsoft or, or uh, Intel, which was started by Andy Grove, an immigrant. It can be a local grocery store that employs a few people. This also has a net benefit, look, right? But, uh, it, well, it depends, again, on who you mean by who benefits. Suppose that, let me, let me give you an example. Suppose that we have, a, we have the U.S. right now, 300 million people or so, 320 million people with a particular capital stock, right? Suppose that we decided tonight to open up uh, a new visa program that would, that would allow 320 million people, new people in. And as part of the visa program, we require them to, to bring as much capital as we already have. So tomorrow morning when we wake up, we really, we really have another U.S. next to us, all right? What would happen to GDP per capita? The answer is, if, if the usual technical assumptions that economists make, that if you double input, you double output, hold, nothing would happen. We actually just replicated our country. So the argument, it turns out that the argument that immigrants bring in capital is not an argument you want to make if you want to stress the gains from immigration. Because all they're, all they're doing is replicating what we have. Immigration is most beneficial when the immigrants bring things that we don't have. So if they just replicate what we have, it's just replicating, it's having two U.S.s, one right here where we are, and one right next to us in the Atlantic Ocean. And that's just GDP doubles. So what? Who, what have we gained? And that will be the counter-argument to that. Okay. Um, let me uh, ask you about H-1B visas. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, were critical of, of uh, Bill Gates, but the fact is that he's not the only one, that virtually every high-tech company has argued, I'm sure most of you know what H-1B visas are, but there's a, there's a cap, 65,000, 85,000 if you add, 20,000 more on top of it. These are uh, visas for high-tech uh, graduates, uh, often of American universities, um, and uh, the competition for them is so great that there are billboards in Silicon Valley from Canada saying it's going to take you six years to get a green card in America, take you six months to get one in Canada, come to Canada. Um, there are teams of German uh, industrialists poaching our, our uh, graduates uh, in California. Every uh, body says, every uh, high-tech company says we need more of these. These are, the, these are not the low-wage workers who are filling jobs, right. cutting grass, right? These are people with very advanced skills and often entrepreneurial instincts who um, we're driving away from this country because we make the process of acquiring visas and green cards so difficult. How do you feel about that program, its role in immigration, and should it be expanded, or do you think it should be contracted? Uh, that's a great question, okay, because I actually have conflicting feelings about this. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, it is certainly See the classic possible. economist, right? Okay, on the yes, one hand, on the other hand. On the other hand, hand, the, on the one hand, hand. And on the other hand. Uh, and hopefully come to a conclusion at the end of all this. Yeah, everybody says you need one-handed economists. That's right. right. Yeah, right. On the one hand, uh, the argument which you just made is correct. Some H-1B visa holders may well come in, introduce all kinds of knowledge, and expand the, the frontier of knowledge. And that could be a tremendous gain to the U.S. There's no denying that, okay? On the other hand, you also look at the New York Times reporting on the H-1B visa program by Julia Preston, right? Where uh, a lot of the H-1B visa holders that actually come in tend to be sort of export, imported through these uh, kind of temporary kind of companies. and Primarily uh, from India. From India. Yeah. 
and it's not a small number. And Disney employees were forced to train their H-1B replacement, right? That's not quite what the program should be about. And the question then becomes, if you look at the actual evidence, what do we know about the H-1B program? And like one, of, one very widely cited study that comes from the, side of, from the side that you were asking claims that when you import H-1B visa holders, the wage of college graduates goes up a lot. And that would be the kind of argument you're making. That's because they're entrepreneurs and because they create of all these economic reasons, right? activity. Into, right. But then what you have to do is look at that study more carefully. Hmm. And if you look at their numbers they report, which they don't actually report this way, but you can just take a little pencil, go to the back of an envelope and do it yourself, they actually claim that their findings suggest that if the Congress were to print 15 million, uh, you know, if the country were to print 15 million H-1B visas, the wage of college graduates go by 80%. Now, that may well be true, even though it's, to me it sounds ridiculously false. But that's a study. That's actually the study people tend to cite about this. Another study, on the other hand, looks at the lottery that H-1B visa holders, uh, the way that H-1B visas are allocated. And it, the H-1B visa program is very weird in many ways. It turns out that it's a first come, first serve kind of program. Right. And then the last day, there's only like 300 visas left. And, and often that's within a week or so of the program opening up. That's, that's right. How, how strong the demand that's is. That's right. And, and not surprising, you know, if H-1B visas actually help Disney get rid of its workforce and hire cheaper workers, the demand will be terrific, right? But anyway, the lottery works in such a way that the last day that visas are available, uh, only if you are available, right? And many people apply. So what DHS does is actually hold the lottery. And that lottery then is allocates those visas randomly. There's another study that actually looked at the winners of the lottery and compared them to the losers. And that other study found no, none of this positive impact. They found a negative employment impact. They found a crowding out effect, a Disney kind of effect. So you look at these competing studies and you tend to argue, well, you don't really know what's going on. I tend to believe the lottery evidence much more than the, the possibility or the claim that 15 million H-1B visas will increase the wage of college graduates by 80%. But that's an unrealistic. I mean, let's talk about the real world and the 65,000 and the 85,000. Right. Uh, are you arguing that the only reason why Bill Gates and all of these companies uh, are in favor of this program is, as you circling back to obviously a, a core uh, view of yours, that um, it's going to depress wages and save them money? It, it has nothing to do with the talent. It has nothing to do with filling a need. It has nothing to do with with, with expanding the the economic activity and the and the and the, and the research capacity of their companies. I would argue. Very, I would argue it's a very important reason. I would argue that firms, like everybody else, has financial incentives. And the H-1B visa program creates a particular set of financial incentives for the people who can do that kind of, for the people who can hire those kinds of workers. But Don't forget, the requirements for H-1B visas, in terms of skills, aren't all that great. Just a college degree. But aren't there two different kinds of competing economic incentives? Because one is, as you point out, can be depressing wages. But if these people who are hired, if, they, if they're hiring them, that create new products and create economic activity, that's a financial incentive too, which right. adds to the bottom line. It's not just depressing wages. That's only one variable in terms of the bottom line. If you are a more successful company with better products and generating more sales, that also adds to the bottom line. I agree, and that's when you have to look at the data then and find out which of these studies actually documents that the, H1B, that, that the firms that get H-1B visas actually become much more productive and much more profitable. And the evidence there is mixed, to put it mildly. Okay, let me ask you another question. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the whole issue of immigration is right on the uh, forefront of the agenda of the new administration. Uh, and one of the most controversial appointments that the uh, uh, new president has already made is Attorney General Jeff Sessions, senator from Alabama who uh, stands for many things, but including perhaps the leading opponent of immigration reform in the U.S. Senate. Uh, and you have said, you have been quoted as saying of uh, Jeff Sessions, there isn't a better qualified person in America to handle the immigration policy for um, uh, the new president. Now this is a man who uh, has opposed all attempts at a rational immigration reform. The immigration reform bill uh, that passed the U.S. Senate with 14 Republican votes, right? Bipartisan bill. Uh, 
and uh, also endorsed by the Bush administration, basically the same, because it was, so it really was a bipartisan approach. Um, Sessions was the leading opponent of it. Um, why do you think Jeff Sessions, uh, given this record, is, is the best qualified person to be in charge of at least the law enforcement side? I understand the Attorney General is only part of the issue of, of immigration policy, but it's an important part and one that the new president has made an, a central part of his policy. Why do you think he's the right person? Okay, you only quoted the very end of my blog post on this and left out my reasoning behind this. And let me tell you the reason. I apologize. Please no, that's fine. That's fine. The, let me tell you the reasoning behind this. From my experience uh, throughout the years, I've run into many people who uh, you know, have something to do with immigration policy. A lot of the time I find that when I talk to these people, they have a, what, a somewhat foggy understanding of the way immigration policy actually works, which makes me think that a lot of what they, a lot of what they uh, do in public in terms of presenting bills and so on is really written by aides, and they really don't quite understand what's going on. Uh, Senator Sessions was actually quite different when I met him. He actually knew the, 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 the extremely excruciating details of the way policy worked. And he also was very much aware of the latest academic research on the subject. So whoever is briefing him, and I have no private information or any of this, makes sure that he keeps up to date, not only with the way immigration policy works, but also with what the latest findings are of how, how to think about this. And that is the same thing which I said to myself and which I wrote, and which I wrote was that if we want to proceed with someone who actually knows something about the way the system works, the way the system is used, and the way the system is abused, to be completely honest, then Senator Sessions will be a, a, an incredibly qualified candidate. And that's what I meant to say by that. The new president has said at times, he, he said conflicting things at times about his immigration policy. But often during the campaign, he talked about deporting all of the 11 million uh, undocumented who are in this country. He talked about a deportation force. Um, and Senator Sessions has been on that side of the argument toward uh, deportation, uh, whether he agrees with deporting all 11 million, obviously there are details right. here, right. But uh, the critics would say this is A, totally unrealistic to be able to in any massive way deport people who are already here. And it would be immoral because many of these 11 million have American-born children and you would be tearing families apart. Plus the fact that the economic impact, which we've talked about, but at least the argument is that this would, to those companies who are looking to hire workers in Texas and Florida, this would also have a negative economic impact. Um, Sessions has stood as, at the side of, of President-elect Trump with these policies. Now why are these critics wrong? Okay, I actually address that in, in, in the book, uh, in the last chapter. I'm not a big fan of deporting 11 million people. I don't think it's the right thing to do, okay, to be totally upfront about this. Uh, I also think, however, that this obsession over the last 10, 15 years with uh, undocumented immigration and amnesty has really corrupted the immigration debate to such an extent that it's very difficult to to have a rational conversation about how to proceed, not just in that direction in terms of illegal immigration, but in general. Mm -hmm. Immigration is much more than illegal immigration, sure, right? Sure, sure. And the, the, the focus on amnesty, on what to do with the immigrants, has really corrupted the debate dramatically. So what I would argue is that uh, the, a, the more sensible way to proceed is to sort of stop on the tracks right now by enforcing the laws we have in terms of new illegal immigration. In other words, let's set up something like E-Verify, for example, where you basically doc, you know, mandate every employer to, to, uh, to make sure that the people they hire are legal, legal, authorized workers, right? That would stop the flow dramatically, I believe, if one were to do that. Now, once we have that you know, taken care of, I think uh, the question becomes, what do we do about the 11 million people who are here, right? You know, I'm going to use an old phrase that you know, goes back to Daniel Moynihan, benign neglect. And uh, why is that? Look, most of the, like you said, most of those people actually have children in the U.S. They have spouses in the U.S. 
they probably have some, time, some kind of family connection that would allow them in the long term to qualify for a family preference visa. So we don't really have to change the immigration laws all that much to allow most of those people to stay in this country through legal means, through family connections. And that's what I would do. I would just uh, make, sure, make sure we don't have to revisit the issue again by, you know, we, we're never going to stop the flow, but we can reduce it substantially. But is, but is benign neglect, it's an interesting concept, is that good enough to protect people, reassure them, not just legally, but psychologically? I've written a lot about this. You have too. There's been a lot of reporting on this. You look at some of my students, you look at many young people in this community and other places who are uh, facing, uh, who are undocumented, perhaps they've been protected by the DACA program, that, uh, uh, and they are deeply, deeply terrified that they or their parents are going to be deported. Uh, the DACA program gave them a measure of security, a measure of, of emotional stability and legal stability. It's, but does b benign neglect solve that problem, or does it require, does it, public policy require some positive statement that gives them the security, both legally and emotionally, that they or their parents are not going to be de deported? Look, uh, there are obviously a million details to be worked out uh -huh. as all this progress, as all this proceeds over time, right? One of the things that is holding things back is, like I said before, we, can, we don't have control right now. If once we had control, I think we could have a much more rational debate over what to do about the 11 million people here. And one thing we could do easily that would assuage, uh, uh, you know, would really take care, attenuate a lot of these issues mm -hmm. would be to, to speed up the granting of, of, of family preference visas, for example. You know, right now there are all long delays and there are long queues in terms right, of getting all right. these visas. Well, if we could somehow convince ourselves that we don't have to revisit this issue five years again from now or ten years from now, it might not be that difficult politically to sort of speed up the system. But isn't that doing what the Senate bill wanted to do by another name? I don't, you know, the Senate bill, I don't know, to be completely honest. I mean, the, the Senate bill has a thousand different interpretations of what to do. One of the things I dislike most about the Senate bill, apart from all this mm -hmm. other stuff, is the fact that they actually had like particular wage rates that they had the quote, that they, mm -hmm. that they inserted mm -hmm. into the marketplace. That's a, you know you cannot micromanage the economy to right. that extent. So for that alone, I would just dismiss the Senate bill as some work. I want to ask you one more question, then we'll get to your your comments. So 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 thank you for your questions for Professor Borjas. One thing that you've said repeatedly. Now you've said you've quoted the, the famous and funny line that. Uh, economists have their morals uh, surgically removed, you know, when they get their degrees. Uh, uh, and that uh, you have argued that your approach is an economic one, not a moral one. Uh, but others would argue that there is a profound moral dimension to immigration. Your family came from Cuba at a time when uh, they were fleeing persecution, as many Cubans were. Wasn't that a perfect example of the moral dimension of one element of immigration? This country welcoming the Cubans or the Hungarians or the Vietnamese or today the Syrians. Isn't there a, isn't there a profound moral dimension to the whole issue of immigration that goes beyond simply dollars and cents? I have a one word answer for that. Yes, there is. Okay, no doubt about it. And that is why it's one of the points I make in the book, immigration policy cannot be determined by numbers alone. I mean, that's just a fact of life. Immigration policy, is something that's, it's really much broader than that. It's really about who we are and what kind of country we want our children to live in. You know, even though I've documented that immigrants tend to harm low-skilled low workers, mm -hmm. I am not of the opinion that we should get rid of low-skilled immigration. And I make that point repeatedly in the, in the book. I'm actually, I, I believe that the U.S., you know, it is something very, um, very honorable to be said about the U.S. as being a country that gave low-skilled workers from all over the world for centuries, right, a chance at the American dream. And I want, that's the kind of country I want to live in. But the problem with what we have now in the system is that we've sort of ignored that these things have consequences. And the system, I mean, a lot of people say the system is broken, right? 
that, that's a complete falsehood. The system is the system that the people who benefit from it paid and bought for from Congress. I mean, that's a system that the lobbyists were fighting for and paid for all these years. And that's the system we have. But that system leaves losers in its wake. And it's the responsible nature of how we've let immig unschooled immigration you know, sort of explode that is creating a problem. So I would never be the person to say, oh, let's just get rid of unskilled immigrants. I mean, I think that, that to me, that's morally the wrong thing to say. Now, and, and I'm talking beyond the, the economic facts right, here, right? right? For any given economic fact, I still think the US has done wonders through, it, through its philosophical attachment to giving people a chance at the American dream. And that's the kind of country we want to live in. Let me turn to uh, the audience. Um, a lot to talk about here. So uh, uh, I will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, I saw this gentleman first, that lady second, and I'll get to you on this side. Go ahead. Your name and affiliation. Uh, Nick Farmer, a private citizen. Uh, can you look ahead uh, 10 or 20 years and think about the impact of uh, automation, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence? A lot of people believe that that's going to have a significant impact on job availability and how that interacts with our immigration policy and what it should be. That's a very good question. Something that I've never worked on and people are just beginning to work on. But I can tell you my gut reaction to the technological shifts that are, that are gonna take place inevitably over the next 20, 30 years. To the extent that this kind of um, automation is going to affect a lot of low-skilled workers. Uh, that would seem to me to be a very strong argument against low-skilled immigration, because all that will do is sort of increase the pool of people that are going to be badly affected by this 20, 30 years down the line. Uh, now, having said that, I go back to this moral issue that I do want to give. You know, th there's something you know, I, there's something very uh, honorable about the U.S. being the kind of country that it is. And I am willing to, as a person, as a human being, I am willing to accept a little cost to allow, that, allow many people from all over the world to have that kind of chance at the American dream. But there's no doubt about the fact that over the next 20, 30 years, more immigration is not the solution to that problem. Thank you, this woman there. And now I'll get to this side. I'll get to you next. Uh, Maria Marta Ferreira from the World Bank. So we talked, so a couple of questions. The first one is on the moral dimension of immigration. So say that the going rate for low skilled workers is $10 an hour, and that a Mexican immigrant is willing to work for seven. But we know that seven is sort of an exploitation wage. And that person is willing to work for seven just because he would make three in Mexico. But again, morally, we're exploiting this worker. What, what would you say to that? That's the first thing. And the, the second question is, Suppose that we do let the employer hire the Mexican person at $7 an hour. What is the solution then for the native that was displaced? What can he do in order to get a job, given that he lost this one? Thank you. OK, so um, as I understand your question, the, the issue really is one in which immigrants, and particularly undocumented immigrants, are being quote unquote exploited by employers because they get a lower wage than they would otherwise get, right? Okay, so, uh, I mean, there's two issues here. One is the moral one and one is the, the factual one, right? The factual one is, is there any evidence that in fact, undocumented immigrants in particular, tend to receive much lower wages given their skills than documented immigrants? And the answer is yes, but the number isn't that large. It's not $7 an hour and $15 an hour. It's something like 10%. And if you look at the trends over the last 20, 30 years, it's actually much smaller today than it's ever been. So maybe now it's like three or 4%. So yes, there's some, kind of, there's some kind of exploitation in the sense that undocumented immigrants for given skills tend to get a lower wage than uh, documented immigrants, uh, but the number is not nothing in the range of what you're talking about. Is that a wrong thing to do? It's illegal. So of course, it's, you know, it's a moral issue, it's also a legal issue. And again, that's one of the problems that we have in not having enforced the laws for the last 20 years. You know, we've created, a, we've created a system, an economy, where employers have such an abundance of cheap labor coming in that they can get away with a lot of stuff. And it's about time we don't, we don't let them. So one of the things I would argue for is when we do have any verified program, 
we should penalize employers as heavily as we can the minute they break the law. But there's also a counter argument, which is that if you provide some kind of legalization, then you deprive the employer of the leverage they have to exploit the undocumented worker. Uh, that it's really the undocumented status which gives the employers right. that leverage so that if you give these, these workers some kind of legal status, you then actually would have the effect of raising the wages. Yeah, and, and, and then what about the that argument? That, 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 that's true. And the question again is by how much? Uh -huh. And that's where I was referring to the data. The, 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 the gap between undocumented wages and documented wages is actually not that large. The reason that people think it's very large is because a typical undocumented worker is like a high school dropout. And the typical documented immigrant has much more education and speaks English and is much more skilled, right? Once you adjust for that, the gap really narrows dramatically. Over here, John, sir. And I'll get to a couple more over here. Hi, I'm Steve Camerata from the Center for Immigration Studies. Uh, George, you talked a lot about wages. But I know one area that gets a lot less attention from economists, but really is the most worrisome trend in the U.S. labor market, is this massive decline of work among the less educated. You see it among people who have some college people who have only a high school education, and you really see it among people who don't have, my, uh, don't have a high school education. And I wonder if you could speak to how much immigration may create a kind of crowding out in a way that maybe wages don't reflect. So the restaurant across from where I work, when they have a job for a new cook, they put the sign up only in Spanish so that the local population of non-Spanish speakers is likely to be shut out of that employment. Um, I want, just, and to the related question, we published a study showing one of the issues is that what immigration lets us do also is lets us ignore social dysfunction among the least educated. So we have this supply of workers. If there's problems with work ethic and skill and substance abuse at the bottom end of the labor market, who cares? Employers don't have to worry about it. The government doesn't because we get the immigrants. Maybe their kids will suffer from those same problems, but we'll just bring in some more immigrants. So think about this huge decline in work, which is really dramatic throughout the labor market, especially among men. Thank you, Steve. Go ahead. That is a great question, and it's a great problem, okay? Uh, in the sense that it's, some, it's a fundamental issue that we have to address and understand, and we really don't understand it yet. You know, as you know, a lot of the work that economists have done have really, has really concentrated on the wage aspect of immigration. And employment has sort of taken a back seat in all this uh, for reasons that I don't really understand. I mean, including my own work. I mean, I could have looked at employment, but I haven't. Uh, the one paper that looked at employment, and that's actually cited in the National Academy report, uh, looked at the employment of young workers in the U.S., and they found very substantial adverse impacts of immigration on employment rates of young workers in the U.S. And again, there hasn't been that much follow-up to that. I think that over the next year, two, three, because these things, these studies take time to do, right? But as, as people begin much, become much more aware of the fact that employment has really become a central, employment of white men particularly, and of low-skilled men, has really become a, a, dramatically, a dramatic issue in the, in the public debate these days, you'll see a lot more studies trying to link, or trying to at least find a link between immigration and those trends. I personally suspect there's something going on there, but my, you know, I have never really looked at it more carefully than just doing a couple of graphs here and there. Uh, and, you know, I feel guilty. I mean, I, sh I should have become much more aware of this earlier on, like most other economists, and I didn't. I, I didn't become aware of it until, or I didn't become aware of how important the trend was until, until the last year. Um, now, what was your second question again? Well, does immigration let us kind of ignore, some of this problem obviously is not immigration, it has to do with social dysfunction among the least educated. But does immigration contribute to that in the sense that we could just ignore it? All right, so they have work ethic problems. All right, they don't have skills. There, there is substance abuse, but don't worry about it. We'll just bring in new immigrants. Their kids might suffer from those same problems, or we'll just bring in a new crop of immigrants. Does it let us ignore the problems of Appalachia, the inner city, that kind of thing? Right, and that's another great question, okay? Because uh, again, we tend to look at things we can measure. <laughs> which is things like you know, the wage or employment rates in the next year or two or things like that. There are all other... Well, we journalists traffic in anecdote. You traffic in data. Exactly. Yeah, difference. Exactly. Go ahead. And, and that's why both things should be, you know, <laughs> help to get a, a bigger picture of what's going on. Uh, you know, 
I personally think that the social, the social consequences of immigration are probably far more important than whether the wage goes down by 10 cents or 25 cents. Uh, on, and if one were to give me data that I could actually look at in terms of trying to document that social impact, believe me, I would drop everything I'm doing right now and look at that right now. Uh, but I haven't, you know, the, the data is hard to get. It is hard to write a convincing kind of academic paper that would sort of document these kinds of trends. But you travel around and you talk to people and you realize that there's something going on. And, you know, just look at the political debate. I mean, the fact is that the political debate in the last year changed dramatically as a result of all these issues finally sort of coming up to the surface and people being allowed to sort of talk about them in public. Let me get to a couple more questions. This is lady over here, and now I'll get to you, sir. Thank you. My name is Li Yang. I just wonder if you can address the issues of how the immigrants although they may be see already citizens uh, naturalized. But I think even American people, just like out of labor force, they are not really unemployment. Actually, it's real unemployment, but not in the statistics. So I just wonder, for immigrants, for maybe language problems, that's not, not really a language problem, but probably it's a social cultural problem more. So they are more likely to be victimized. But in the study or research, usually they don't have database. So is there any study they really dig into that problem, see how they are victimized, exploitation, how they are harassed and, and lost, not only their wage, but also their income and assets. I think the question, if, uh, I want to be clear in your question. You say, is there any studies about the way immigrants have been victimized right. uh, uh, and exploited? Right. Is that, is that your question? Uh -huh. Not yeah. only employment, not only their earning, but also their accumulation or investment or capital assets or human resources, whatever okay. you can think of, including okay. their family and offspring. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK. so. Uh, among economists, the typical way we look at sort of victimization or exploitation is by looking at wage impacts, right. you know, the wage differences, right? And, the, you know, amazingly enough, uh, most economists, whenever they see a wage gap between blacks and whites or between men and women, a lot of people will jump instinctively to sort of a discrimination-based story. That is not the usual jumping to place when we look at immigrants. And the reason is that a lot of immigrants actually tend to do very well. A lot of immigrant groups actually do perform way better than the typical native person performs in the labor market. So discrimination would not really be a very sensible argument to make. And then among those groups that tend to do poorly, and the group people have looked at a lot are Mexicans, which tend to have very low earnings, a lot of that gap disappears once we adjust for educational differences. For educational differences, okay? exactly. So if you look at equally educated people, there really is very little evidence that the typical Mexican immigrant is much worse off than the typical American worker. You know, uh, uh, in the studies have been, as you know better than me, but over generations now have tracked different immigrant groups. Right. Uh, and that, as you point out, the level of education, the average level of education in each immigrant group is the critical variable in terms of progress if you measure right. it by wages. Right. Right. And that the group that often is cited as comparable are Italians, because when they came over, um, they tended to come from southern Italy, they tend to right. be very low education, and that they often, this is a vast generalization, but they took an extra generation That's right. uh, to uh, catch up to a lot of other immigrant groups. That's right. But once they got the educational level, then the wages followed. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, this gentleman over here. My name is Mark Venezia. I'm associated with the Center for Individual Rights. Um, I want to relate two topics. So you discussed uh, E-Verify, and I don't know that you have discussed sanctuary cities. But the first, you, you said we should have more enforcement, stricter enforcement of E-Verify. So I take that that's, there's discretionary non-enforcement going on because it's already the law. Well, maybe you can explain that. The second is, it, does the existence of sanctuary cities have any relationship to the lack of enforcement of E-Verify, assuming there is such? Uh, my understanding is that E-Verify is not a mandated kind of requirement right now for employers. Not. It's not. 
And that's what I was saying, if we were mandated as part of all new hires, it might make a huge difference. And at least it would be something that you could hold an employer, an employer accountable. In other words, it would be much clearer that the employer broke the law if we find somebody in their employee that does not qualify. So uh, I am not an expert on the minute details of the law, but my understanding right now is that not, it's in some states, not in other states, and not all firms need to go through Verify to actually hire workers these days. So the typical, the typical system now is that when you apply for a job, you file a form like the I-9 or something like that, and employers look at documents you bring in, and that's really all they're required to do. So there's a lot of loopholes in who they are allowed to hire. And, and they don't really look very closely at whether these documents are legitimate. Of, or, and right? that, that's the loophole. Right. That's the loophole. And even if I will get rid of that loophole. Other questions? Please, go ahead, ma'am. Did I see someone in the back there, too? Did I say, I'll get to you next. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Jen Riccardi with the European Union. Um, to turn to high school immigration for a moment, is there a policy prescription that would make you more comfortable with the existing programs, whether it's uh, wage you know, verifications that you're not um, undermining the prevailing wage in a given sector, or the other um, requiring reciprocity from, from uh, host nations where the, the temporary workers are coming in from? I'm just wondering if there's a policy prescription that makes you more comfortable with high-skilled immigration. Thanks. Uh, I can understand that. She wanted to know if there's a um, uh, policy prescription, high-skilled immigration. Um, uh, you were asking is there a, a way to, uh, an, a policy innovation that would um, uh, take care of some of the problems we we're talking about when the H-1B visas of wage depression? Yeah. Right. right. Is, is Labor Department sort of right. Got not it. undermining the wage? Okay, mm -hmm. there's a very simple way of doing it in the following way. Let, let's go back to Bill Gates. He claims that Microsoft creates four new jobs for every, for every H-1B visa that they get, right? If that's true, and let's, 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 stipulate, let's stipulate that that's a true fact, uh, that means that Microsoft is profiting substantially from every single visa they get. Well, let's charge them. Let's charge Microsoft for every visa they get, many thousands of dollars. They already did. No, they charge them a lot more. In, in, in <laughs> Singapore, in Singapore, whenever you import a guest worker, you pay 20% of their monthly salary every single month to the government. We don't charge that to Microsoft. So let's charge Microsoft, you know, see how much they're willing to pay. I'd be surprised, you, I think we'll be presently surprised by how much these firms are willing to pay to get one of those visas. And let's use those monies to, 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 uh, to, um, Compensate the losers. One follow-up question: When Microsoft says that they're sorry, when uh, Bill apologize. Gates says that there's four jobs created for every H-1B visa that, that's granted, is he talking within Microsoft or is he talking within his supply chain? Which is a whole different question, given the way supply chains work in the economy now. Right. Look, let me let me answer this in general. Okay, what I think has to be done is that we have to think about immigration policy in a broader way. Until today, until now, we've thought of immigration policy in the context of two questions. How many immigrants to admit and which immigrants to admit? And that's really what policy, the way the law is written, that's, it, that's what it's about. I think we have to add a third leg to that little you know, uh, kind of structure. And the third leg is let's make sure that the gains and losses are more equally distributed. Right now, the gains are going to a very few people and the losses are being suffered by other workers. Well, let's, let's have an immigration debate in a setting where these gains and losses are much more evenly distributed. That would lead to a much more honest assessment of what it is that the country should do. I think we have time for one more. This gentleman in the back here. You, sir. Dan Semmelsberger of the R Street Institute. Uh, may you provide us a survey of the second generation of immigrants? How uh, does their education level compare to the first generation? How does the wage compare? And what job sectors are they going into? Thank you. Okay, so uh, on, on average, what you tend to see is that the second generation does better than the first generation. Uh, something like a 10% increase in wages. Again, the metric that we use to measure improvement, right? And what you also see is that there are huge, I mean, as you look around, there are huge ethnic differences in how different groups perform. So for example, Mexicans will do far worse than the average, and Indian immigrants will do far better than the average, right? Those differences tend to sort of contract over generations. So people become much more alike. In other words, the melting pot works. 
Now, the experience that we have is over the last century. But as you pointed out, the key variable tends to be education. Exactly. As right. education levels uh, start coming together, then that uh, That's right. wage levels and other exactly right. metrics come together. And it, you know, if you look at the, at, the, at the experience of the last century, it took three generations for these things to sort of disappear. Right. Which is about 100 years. It's not in a long time, but in the scheme of things, it's not that big a deal. Now, the question really, which is more important, is can we expect the past to repeat itself? And don't forget, the last, the melting pot in the 20th century worked under a particular set of circumstances. Right. And I'll mention two just to conclude, okay? One is when immigrants came in 1900, they basically built the manufacturing sector. And, uh, the and just to give you an, an example of how important immigration was to manufacturing back then, something like three quarters of employees at the Ford Motor Company in 1915 were foreign born. Now the reason that's important is because these manufacturing jobs eventually became unionized and became very high paying jobs. And these union jobs were transferred within the family and were really a, an entree into the middle class sure. for immigrant households. Now the question becomes in the 21st century, Will that kind of entree happen for the kinds of jobs that employ immigrants today? I'm not sure. The second issue that's important to remember is that all that assimilation in the 20th century happened under a unique set of circumstances. You know, just to give an example, there were two world wars. And we fought two world wars, and the people we fought against were groups like Germans and Italians that had a lot of immigrants living in the US. And uh, again, another example from World War I. In 1915, there were something like 500 German language newspapers in the US. By 1920, half had disappeared. Many states passed laws prohibiting people from speaking German in public and prohibiting schools from teaching German. Well, that was like encouraged assimilation, if you want to think of it that way. And, uh, you know, again, to the extent that these things are not reproducible, we don't really know what's going to happen in the next century. So, my take from the historical experience is that, yes, the melting pot worked, it took a century, but I think it'd be a mistake to, to sort of learn from that, that this will always be the case. I would add a third factor actually, and that's communication. Yes. Uh, when my grandfather came to America, he was out of touch with his sister in Moscow for 50 years. 50 years. Today, any immigrant can Skype with his mother back in the smallest village in, in China or India or Kenya, right? At zero cost. At zero cost. So the, one of the really interesting dimensions looking forward That's a good point. is how does this change the immigrant experience? Because the separation from the homeland was an incentive to assimilation, right? right. My right. grandfather couldn't go back, he couldn't talk back, he had to assimilate. Right. But if you can talk, you know, sit there, and, and I profiled a Chinese scientist the other day who sat there in a, in a delicatessen in Rockville doing business with his friends back in China on his iPhone. <laughs> now, that's a very different ex immigrant. Right. Some things about immigration never change, right? right. But one of the really interesting research questions looking forward to add to your two is right, the right, question right, of right, communications right. and how that affects the, the process of assimilation. That's a great point. Cut off immigration, that's a really big one. Yeah, great, well look, we could obviously continue this conversation. It's been a very thought-provoking conversation. I really appreciate Thank you. Uh, Professor Thank you. Borhaus for being here and all of you for joining in. Thanks a lot. Thank you.